I'll start by introducing Drew and more people will join. So Drew Corrali, it's a great pleasure to introduce him. Drew has been really a leader in um, the microbiome. He comes from, I just MD and PhD at UConn um, and did his, did his graduate work in the laboratory of uh, Betty Iper working on uh, cocaine and some of the kind of molecular changes that ha happen at the synapse in response to cocaine. And then he came to Mount Sinai to do a research uh, residency, in the physician scientist track, and he did his research side in Eric Nestler's lab. And during that time, he got an um, uh, Outstanding Resident Award and uh, ACMP Travel Award, and um, also received the uh, Leon Levy Fellow in Neuroscience Award and a Siever Fellowship as well. And then when he finished uh, his training with uh, Eric Nestler and as a resident, then he came, went on to be um, an assistant press professor in both psychiatry and neuroscience. And his laboratory really focuses on uh, the neuroimmune system and the gut brain uh, interactome and how interaction and how that impacts uh, neuro psychiatric disorders. So uh, I think you all know that the microbiome and particularly the gut brain interaction of that is a really, really hot area. And there's a lot going on thinking about, about a role in many things, including psychiatric disorders. And uh, so welcome, Drew, and look forward to your talk. Okay, hey, great. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm happy to be here today. Just uh, let me share my screen. Can, I, can, can you see that now? Yes. Um, okay, great. So yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to, to be here and get a chance to talk talk with uh, people today. Uh, so, you know, like like Joe mentioned, I'm I'm a I'm an MD PhD, and so I'm I'm a, a practicing psychiatrist. I still see patients, uh, you know, on our inpatient units and in the emergency room, and but in private practice. But uh, m most of what my lab does is, is using uh, is using animal models. Um, you know, of neuropsychiatric diseases ranging from fiction to autism to depression, um, and, and, and trying to think of, of new uh, potential translational research strategies, um, you know, for, for developing new biomarkers or treatments for, for patients uh, with different conditions. Um, you know, and, and so what, what I hope to do today is to, to kind of give a, a, a good solid overview of one of, one of the more uh, well-developed projects in our lab. Um, most of the work I'm going to show today is the work of uh, a, a senior grad student lab, Catherine Meckel. Um, you know, I want to talk through some of the animal model work and sort of how we've been thinking about this and how we've been trying to tease apart gut brain and interactions in this model for addiction. Um, and then since I know it's more of a clinical audience, at the end I kind of wanted to, to, to pivot a little bit and, and give some overview of, of um, new areas that we're trying to move with, with um, making this more translational and, and how, how we think um, you know, this, this can become, um, you know, truly a, a bench to bedside translational, um, you know, with, w within the next few years, really start thinking about how this, how this works on uh, human patients. Um, uh, so like Joe mentioned, it's, it's, it's the, the, the focus will be on the, the uh, gut microbiome and the subsequent metabolome. Um, and we'll be looking at, at um, drug seeking behavior, particularly in a model of cane use disorder today. Um, and here's my information if anyone wants to email me or tweet me since that's a thing people do now, um, certainly feel free. Um, okay, so no, uh, no financial conflicts of interest uh, to declare. Um, so to, to take things back to when, when I was a, a, a resident here at Mount Sinai, um, you know, when I, when I was in my, my research years, my residency, I was trying to figure out what, what would be the best direction to go in uh, for a course of study. And, you know, my, my, my graduate work was very focused on uh, synaptic proteomics and things that were really embedded in the synapse, um, but also things that, that, you know, and things that, that are really important for the, for the neurobiology of addiction, but things that are maybe less targetable um, from a translational point of view. And so I, I wanted to try and think of things that I, that I thought had potential for clinical translation down the road. Um, you know, and so when I, when I was seeing patients, you know, particularly patients at the VA, those with substance use disorders, um, you know, as well as at Mount Sinai, I really started thinking about the, the concept of, of, of addiction and other psychiatric conditions as really whole body diseases. And you know, a lot of these patients had other medical comorbidities. They had significant, uh, you know, diet and nutritional changes because of, because of their conditions, um, changes in stress, sleep. You know, all the, all these things that are kind of affected throughout the body. And so um, we really started. You know, when the lab started, we we began by targeting things that that were kind of external to this that we thought could have an influence in us. 
Um, and so the two main arms of research in the lab uh, have been first to look at how changes in the immune system can affect the brain. And so looking at uh, different circulating cytokines and, and populations of leukocytes and how those might be um, able to be measured or manipulated to have effects on the brain. Um, and the other is this, this relatively new field of gut brain signaling. So this idea that uh, you have this population of trillions of microorganisms in your gut that somehow signals to the brain uh, in ways that can be either adaptive or maladaptive. Um, you know, and so while, the, while this work has been getting started and you know, you know, things have been getting off the ground, we've really had these two main focuses. And so um, the first is, is to look in these two arenas and, and look, for identi uh, you know, look to identify actionable targets and pathways. What are things that we could um, you know, identify, measure, or manipulate uh, to, to potentially change the course of, of substance use disorder for our patients? Um, and then second, you know, si since we're doing this in animal models, we, we really want to work to understand what the underlying mechanisms are um, of these influences. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and as, as I mentioned, you know, wh wh while there are kind of these two main arms of, of, of work in the lab, but today I really want to focus in on, on um, so newer work, that's the, 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 um, the subject of a, a couple of manuscripts that we have coming out, as well as um, an R1 that's that's scheduled to be funded. And so I think this is kind of some, some of the hottest, hottest new stuff from the lab and something I haven't really presented that much previously. Um, so it, it's it's maybe a kind of an interesting question of how it is that that a, a psychiatrist decided to study the microbiome in the first place. Um, and I can actually really trace back um, my thoughts to this of, of you know what why I thought this was interesting to one paper that I read when I was when I was a research fellow. Um, and so there's a paper that came out in, in 2011 that used two different lines of mice. And so uh, one of these lines was this NIH Swiss mouse, which are, are mice that are kind of non-anxious at baseline. Um, and the way, the way we are measuring this anxiety-like behaviors in mice is um, we're, we're, we're putting them on a, a platform that's kind of in the middle of, a, of an open field and they don't know what lies beneath. And you look how quickly the mouse kind of hops down off that platform you know, and a mouse that has less of an anxiety like phenotype will kind of hop down quickly and sort of go off and explore the unknown. And a more anxious mouse will spend more time up there kind of being afraid to, to venture off, worried about predators or whatever might lie out there. Um, and so they were comparing these non-anxious mice, these NIH Swiss, to these anxious mice, the Balb C. And so you can see there's a real difference here. Um, at baseline, the NIH Swiss mice, they kind of hop right off that platform in about 20 seconds. Uh, whereas the Balb C mice, you know, they take almost 300 seconds to come to come down. It's, it's really a pretty big difference. Um, and this was a study was done by gastroenterologists and they were, they were kind of interested in the effects of the gut microbiome on some of these behaviors. And so what they did was really interesting was they basically just did a gut microbiome transplant between the two lines of mice. So they took a non-anxious mouse uh, microbiome and put it in an anxious mouse and vice versa. And so you have these mice that theoretically have these kind of um, inherent baseline characteristics that are that are that are relatively inflexible, um, and all we did was change the bacteria that are living in their gut, really. And the thing that was really interesting was that that this change of the gut the gut flora, all they did was change the bacteria, and you get this this robust change um, in these anxiety-like behaviors. So the mice that, that were previously non-anxious here, um, when you put in the the anxious microbiome, they became more anxious, significantly so. Um, and the same thing happened in the other direction, whereas if you took a, an anxious mouse and instilled it with a non-anxious microbiome, uh, they become, became significantly anxious. And so this, I mean, this was really interesting to me. They, they did a bunch of cool things in this study, um, and they actually were able to flip the, the anxiety phenotype back by, by killing off this microbiome with antibiotics and putting back the, the original one. And they did a bunch of control showing that it wasn't due to other kind of off-target effects. Um, and also going along with these anxiety-like phenotypes, um, they, they saw changes in important uh, trophic factors and other things in the brain. And so this is looking at levels of uh, BDNF, a brain-derived neurotrophic factor in the hippocampus. Um, and just changing, changing the microbiome uh, actually led to changes in BDNF levels in the hippocampus. And so um, this, this was kind of how I got into this and, 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 and sort of what, what kind of drove me down this path um, of, of thinking about this in a, in a Neuropsychiatric context, because um, I thought it, it was really interesting, um, you know. And and since that paper came out, which is now it's now almost ten years old, um, you know, there there's been a, a robust increase in the number of papers uh, on PubMed that are, that are published on this gut brain signaling. And so, uh, this was a the 
a PubMed search for the number of papers that show up for the term uh, microbiome and neuron or brain is, is the search that, that I did. Um, you know, and so over the course of time, the, the, the field has really taken off. Um, you know, you can see that last year there was about 800 papers published, um, you know, on, on this topic, you know, both, both in animal models and in human subjects. Um, you know, and, and it, it really has kind of started, started to take shape. And there's been a bunch of different effects that have been shown to be driven by the gut microbiome. And so um, changing uh, microbiome composition or complexity can, can affect um, dendrite length and spine maintenance in the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. It can affect neurotransmitter levels in the stratum, the hippocampus, all, really all throughout the brain um, are driven by changes in these, in these gut the bacteria that live in our gut. Um, there's a really pretty robust growing literature, literature showing that the microbiome can affect uh, myelination status of neurons and um, you know, maybe actually a potential uh, uh, therapeutic target in MS and other demyelinating conditions. Um, one that's actually of particular interest to me and that we'll, we'll spend some time going into is it, it, it seems like the microbiome and the state of the microbiome is actually really important for gene expression in the brain. Um, and a bunch of studies have shown that mice who have altered microbiomes have changes in chromatin accessibility and neurons and glia throughout the brain. Um, they have changes in immediate early gene expression in response to external stimuli. Um, you know, in cell-specific transcriptomic analysis using single single cell or single nucleus sequencing, uh, ha has shown that um, all populations of neuron and glia throughout there are, are really affected by uh, the state of the microbiome. Um, you know, additionally, uh, blood-brain barrier integrity is something that's been, been less well studied, but is another interesting idea. It's, it's something that's maintained by the microbiome. So there's this really growing idea that the microbiome is important for kind of health and homeostasis of the brain uh, through, throughout the lifespan. Um, you know, and, and, you know, in all these studies, people have seen uh, effects of the microbiome on the brain in models of, of autism and depression. Uh, Parkinson's has some of the strongest um, literature supporting it, uh, Alzheimer's multiple sclerosis, um, and also addiction, which has been, been studied less by, less by other people. And, and, and my lab has really kind of been trying to uh, take, take the lead on some of these gut brain studies and addiction. And I think an important thing from, from all these things to take away is really that it seems like what the field uh, has found is that while there may be specific populations of, of bacteria that are important for things, uh, in the brain and, and different bacteria will affect different things. Um, I think the overall message is that really what you need is you need the presence of a complex microbiome uh, for, the, for the normal development of, of brain and behavior. And so, um, you know, kind of a good way to, to, to measure this and to sort of look at kind of like broad scale effects of this is to see how does a complex versus a non-complex microbiome affect brain and behavior. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so, uh, when, when we're looking at this, and we're looking at the mechanism of how how a complex microbiome of the gut can signal all the way to the brain, you know, it's really important to think of, you know, how, how is that communication happening, right? Because we have this, the, the gut, which is pretty physically distal from the brain, and we want to know how all these bacteria are creating some kind of signaling pathway that, that leads to the brain um, to, to affect uh, neuropsychiatric disease in a way that's meaningful to us as, as psychiatrists and neuroscientists. Um, and so uh, one of the best studied pathways, and this is the one I'll be talking about the most today, is um, these, these bacteria in your gut, are, they're a highly metabolically active ecosystem. And so all these things are, are they're living critters that are um, taking nutrients and metabolizing them and producing byproducts. And um, you know, many hundreds, if not thousands of metabolites are produced by the microbiome and absorbed into the circulation. Um, and, and there's really good literature showing that a number of these can actually uh, cross the blood-brain barrier and can affect, uh, can affect things uh, function in the brain. Um, so another is, uh, you know, uh, interactions of the gut microbiome with the immune system. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've all heard the idea that the majority of our immune system kind of takes up residence in our gut, uh, which is, you know, broadly speaking, a true statement. Um, you know, and so through interactions with, with resident immune cells in the gut, um, the gut microbiome is very important for educating and, and helping mature different um, immune cell populations, uh, range, ranging from T cells to neutrophils to um, uh, B cells and various other kinds. So that's, you know, and, and then immune signals can then, can then affect the brain in various ways, which is um, kind of a potential mechanism. Um, and the third is that there's this, this robust connection 
uh, of the gut and the brain with, via the vagus nerve. And so um, the, the vagus nerve is our, is our 10th cranial nerve that, that descends uh, from the hindbrain is important for uh, cardiac function and, and um, intestinal function. Um, but in addition to the, these descending afferents, there are also efferents that go from the gut uh, back up to the brain. And through, through a couple of synapses can actually signal to some limbic nuclei uh, that are that are important for for the diseases we're interested in, um, and so some some in some ways that the gut microbiome is able to signal uh, through altering function of the vagus nerve in ways that might affect the brain, um, uh, in ways relevant to neuropsychiatric disease. Um, and so, like I mentioned, what what we sort of want to do is, is is to is to kind of see if we can take away this complex gut microbiome, um, and then and then measure and dissect how, how it is that it's affecting brain and behavior. Um, and so the way that we're doing this is actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty simple model, but it's been one that's been very, very effective for us. And so um, basically what it is, is we take animal, um, and actually most of what I'm, this is a drawing of a rat, but most of what I'm going to show you today is mice, but there's a little bit of rat data mixed in here as well. Um, we just give them this cocktail of, of non-absorbable antibiotics in their, in their home cage drinking water. Um, and so basically the idea is we have these antibiotics that, that don't get absorbed into the circulation. So they, they, they go into the gut and they kill the bacteria and then are generally excreted in the feces uh, without uh, creating any potential off-target uh, effects that would be seen by, by uh, their absorption into the circulation. Um, you know, and so what we can see is that we, we not surprisingly, this is very effective at, at, at reducing the bacterial uh, diversity and so reducing that microbiome complexity. Um, so you see here, and, and throughout my talk, the uh, blue is going to be the control water, and then the, the red or pink will be the antibiotic treated animals. Um, you know, when we look at the observed number of species that are observed in the gut, you can see it, it, it after two weeks of treatment, it's it's down uh, more than 99%. Um, you know, and, and we can and we can keep the animals on this cocktail of antibiotics, and this this the species diversity remains very low throughout. And so, um, you know, we can kind of have this model of an animal that has then uh, normally developed young adulthood, and then we can take away the biome and see how that affects its behavior. Um, you know, when, when we were developing this model, a really important concern for us is that, you know, we're, we're, we're in this, this kind of whole change in the gut microbiome, so it's really, really important um, that these animals are, are animals that lack a microbiome but are otherwise largely healthy and normal, so that when we're, when we're looking at their, at their behaviors, um, you know, we're not just seeing some effects of sickness behavior or weight loss of, you know, some kind of off-target effects of things. And so we've spent a lot of time doing controls, to make sure that these animals growing are normal and healthy. And so, um, you know, we've looked at uh, drinking and see how much, how much uh, liquid intake they have. And there's really, there's no difference in the antibiotic group. Uh, the same is true for food. Um, you know, when we track animals' body weight over time, we can see that the, the water and antibiotic groups gain weight. Um, over the course of antibiotics for six weeks at, at, at the same rate. So, um, you know, they're kind of not having any sort of weight loss or any other apparent nutritional uh, deficits. Um, you know, when we, when we look at how much they, they move around, how much they're interacting with their environment, um, you know, again, across multiple time points for animals that have been on antibiotics for a long time, uh, we see there's no, no effect of our antibiotics. Um, you know, without doing immune challenges, we also want to make sure that kind of the baseline levels of uh, inflammatory markers and other cytokines are pretty much normal. Um, and so here we look at uh, levels of the pro-inflammatory IL-6 and IL-1 beta cytokines and see no changes there. Um, one of my grant reviewers uh, asked us questions about stool frequency. So um, uh, lucky for Catherine, she then got to spend two weeks counting how often our, our mice pooped. Um, and we saw that there was an equal number of, of production of uh, stool between the two groups. Um, stress hormones and everything that could that could be affected by gut microbiome changes. Um, we see that there's no no changes in corticosterone between our, our water or our microbiome depleted animals. Um, and importantly for this study, uh, you know, there, there's no effect on cocaine metabolism either. And so this is looking at uh, the primary metabolite of cocaine. Um, after either a high or low dose injection. And at the high dose, we did multiple time points and there's no effect. Um, and at the lower dose, we did the one time point and there was no effect. So, um, you know, this is a slide that ends up having a lot of things on it, but I think this is actually a really, really important slide for establishing our baseline of what we're looking at and, and saying that we have this model 
in which we've knocked down the microbiome robustly, uh, but we have animals that are kind of otherwise healthy and behaving normal at baseline. So I think that's, that's really important for going forward. Um, and so when I, actually when I was in Eric's lab, we, we started out um, by looking at a model of, of substance abuse that's called condition place preference. And so um, like I just described, we, we, we put our animals on antibiotics for two weeks. Um, and then we performed this drug seeking task called condition place preference. And basically uh, this is a model in which uh, we have a, a apparatus that has two chambers that are contextually different. They look different from each other. Um, and basically the animals are trained that that one side gets paired with, with the rewarding effects of getting an, inject, an injection of cocaine. Um, and the other side gets paired with saline. Look at do, how much preference do they show for one side versus the other. Um, and the thing that was really interesting was when we gave the animals these antibiotics that knocked down their microbiome, we saw that they, they, for a low dose of cocaine that the control animals didn't form a preference for, the mi microbiome deficient animals actually formed a really robust preference. So this sort of suggests that, the, that changing the microbiome is, is affecting the rewarding effects of this drug. Um, you know, interestingly, this was a dose dependent effect. If we went to higher doses, there was no difference. And then I'll come back later, but um, this was a really striking effect. Um, you know, and the other control that we did here that I think is important uh, is we also did parenteral antibiotics, where we where we basically took the same doses of antibiotics that they were drinking and inject, injected them IP. Um, you know, even though we don't really think our antibiotics are being absorbed very much, you know, this this is a control for kind of any off-target effects. Um, and we see that this regimen doesn't uh, deplete the microbiome in nearly the same way and leads to no differences. Um, so it suggests to us that this depletion of the microbiome is actually what's really important for these changes in behavioral response to cocaine that we're seeing. Um, you know, so that, that was the initial study. We published that um, about four years ago now. But since then, we, we, we've worked on moving on to more translationally relevant models of uh, substance use disorder. And so uh, CPP is a great model for a bunch of things, but it also has a lot of caveats. And so, um, the model that we're moving into, I think, is honestly one of the better models for a neuropsychiatric disease that you can do in a rodent, um, is drug self-administration. And so for these experiments, we take either a, a mouse or a rat, um, and we implant it with an indwelling catheter and, and basically put it in an operant box and allow it to, uh, allow it to administer itself a drug um, over the course of the time. Now we can look at volitional drug intake, and then we can look at drug-seeking behaviors down the road. Um, you know, and so basically what we do is, you know, after the animals have the catheter put in, um, we, we allow them to acquire self-administration where basically every time they press a lever, they get a high dose of cocaine and they learn to like that. Um, and so they kind of develop this robust drug taking behavior. Um, you know, and, and this is kind of the first place where we can sort of look at how microbiome manipulations or other manipulations affect uh, drug taking, right? And so once they've learned to take drugs, we can sort of look and see what's the difference in their dose response um, for the drugs? Will they respond differently at different doses or different reinforcement schedules, um, which we can do using behavioral economics procedures, um, you know, or we can do progressive ratio where the animal has to work harder and harder for, for each administration um, during a session. So, but for me as a, as a clinician, someone who, who cares for patients with substance use disorder and sort of thinking about, you know, really what's the, what's the gold standard for our treatment, where is the biggest treatment need? Um, you know, I, I, th I think, you know, kind of the, the, the clearest need, um, you know, in the clinical sense is to develop something that will help, uh, you know, reduce the risk of relapse after, after you know, either short or long periods of abstinence. And so this is where we've started to focus our models, which, which in our models called reinstatement, which is basically that if you allow the animals to be abstinent for a long period of time, they will, they will exhibit these relapse type behaviors where they basically will start seeking drug again when you put them back in the context. There are various ways you can test this relapse type behavior, um, either by playing cues that are associated with the drug or um, actually giving them injection of the drug before you put them back in the box, um, you know, giving them stress, um, or putting them back in the context associated with the drug. And, you know, I think, you know, for those of you who are clinicians in the audience, you can understand these are things that we see in our patients, right? And so that, you know, kind of going out and being exposed to, to, to people, places, and things that are associated with drugs can trigger relapse. Um, you know, uh, take, taking drug again after a period of absence can kind of trigger a prolonged relapse event, stressors lead to relapse kind of thing. So, you know, I, th I think for us, this was kind of something that we honed in on as one of the more important areas to, to study. Um, 
you know, and it's one that I think interesting in our animal models, but also um, clinically relevant, uh, potentially, hopefully. Um, so how are, we, how are we doing this in our, in our animal model? And so um, what we're doing here is we're taking uh, mice or rats, this is uh, mice in this case, and um, we're implanting with a catheter and we're putting them on antibiotics for two weeks. Uh, we're then training them to take uh, cocaine on an FR1 schedule, which means every lever press gets them an uh, infusion of drug. Um, and then we're and then we're putting them back in their home cage to allow them to to develop this kind of a cocaine relapse type behavior, this this drug seeking type behavior. Um, and then we put them back in the box and do a, a, a drug seeking test for a Q light or for a cocaine. Um, and so when we do this, uh, that's my animation. Sorry, I'm having an issue with my animation showing up here. What is happening? All right. Um, <clears throat> so when we do this, we, we started out by, by training the animals to, to administer themselves a higher dose of cocaine, because we knew from our previous studies that high dose cocaine uh, was the same between groups. And since we're interested in how a microbiome is going to affect drug seeking, we wanted them to learn to take drug the same. Um, and so that's basically what we saw that um, over the course of two weeks of, of self-administering drug, the animals learned to and stabilized uh, at administering uh, drugs at essentially the same level. So that's that's good for us. And so we're kind of starting here from the same baseline. And that, then now we'll know how, how, how does four weeks of withdrawal with or without a normal microbiome, how does that affect the development of these relapse type behaviors? Um, and so what we did here um, was we did a, a Q-induced drug seeking task where basically uh, we put them back in the box and the Q light that was associated with the drug that's coming from up here uh, is turned back on. And we look at how much animals press the lever um, that was previously associated with the drug, but they're not getting any, any drug here. They're just pressing for the Q. Um, and so what you can see is that our, our, our control animals, um, they show this relapse type behavior like we would expect them to. They press the active lever much more than the inactive, uh, even though it's no longer associated with drugs. They're kind of doing that sort of drug seeking type behavior. And the thing that's really interesting with this, similar to our previous uh, place preference results, we see that um, you know, our, our antibiotic animals also discriminate the active from the inactive lever. They're showing this directed drug seeking type behavior, um, but it's really at a much more uh, robust uh, drug seeking level than, than our control animals. And so sort of suggesting that the, the, the lack of a, a complex microbiome might be affecting kind of the development of these drug seeking type behaviors. Um, and we did a similar thing, uh, where we paired, we did drug induced seeking, where we basically gave the animals an injection of cocaine prior to prior to the session. Um, you know, and again, our control animals, they 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 show the drug seeking type behavior, although kind of at lower levels than previous. Um, and the same thing, the animals that 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 don't have a normal microbiome have this really robust uh, drug induced seeking behavior. Um, you know, and so it's really the the animals who lack a normal microbiome have this this increased drug seeking behavior. Um, you know, and so this is, a, this is kind of an important point for our interim conclusion here, um, which is that the, the re this reduction in microbiome complexity leads to increased cocaine uh, seeking increased uh, reinstatement behaviors. Um, you know, and so now, now we want to try and figure out, you know, what, what are the underlying mechanisms? What's explaining this? Um, you know, and so one of the first things that we did, I mentioned that um, people have shown that um, uh, the gut microbiome is important for uh, transcriptional regulation of the brain. Um, and so what we did was a, a similar experiment where we took animals and we put them on antibiotics or control water for, for two weeks. Um, and we gave them injections of cocaine or saline for um, 10 days, I believe. And then let them go do home cage withdrawal for four weeks. And we gave them a challenge injection of cocaine or saline and then looked at, at changes in gene expression in the nucleus accumbens uh, which is also known as the ventral striatum and is an area that's very important for, for driving these drug seeking behaviors. And we compared the, the, the transcriptomic profiles between our control animals and, and, and those that, that their, their normal micro, microbiome depleted. Um, and so this is just a, a, an overall view. This is a, for those who aren't familiar, this is what's known as a volcano plot. Um, and so this is basically a gene expression levels of all the genes across the transcriptome. Um, and for all these on the slide, it's going to be um, a treatment group compared to a uh, control group. Um, and basically the higher something is up on this y-axis, the more statistically significant it is, and the wider out it is, uh, 
the, the, the big full changes compared to the control. And so this is just kind of a, a quick and dirty way to look at these uh, you know, 10 plus thousand data points per sample and see how many are, are significant. And kind of the, the bigger the eruption you have, the more, the more uh, genes have been changed. And so um, you know, what we see is that this antibiotic treatment on its own actually doesn't have, uh, has a pretty minimal effect on, on gene expression in the accumbens. Um, but when we uh, look at animals that, that were control water um, versus the saline group, we see that you know, this cocaine challenge injection leads to significant regulation of, of a couple hundred genes. And so um, you know, this is the response to, to genes that are being turned on um, by giving this cocaine injection after withdrawal. Um, we see regulation of, of, of a few. And the thing that I think is, is really striking here is that when, when, we, when we then look at the animals that were on antibiotics that got this cocaine challenge at the end here, uh, compared to the water controls, we see this really dramatic effect. So um, animals that lack a microbiome that get this kind of robust external stimulus of, of, of a cocaine challenge then have, have really marked dysregulation of gene expression in the brain. And so we, we, we now see instead of a couple, we're seeing many thousands of genes that are significantly different than the water controls. Um, and you know, so I think this is showing kind of like a really interesting interaction between you know, the drug treatment and the lack of a microbiome to really drive this much larger effect um, in, in, the, in the transcriptional response to, uh, to a challenge injection of cocaine. Um, you know, and so th that was obviously you know, a very kind of high, high level analysis of, of, of genes that are changed um, in this model. And so you know, we, we've worked on kind of digging in a bit more into, into what specific gene pathways are altered. Um, you know, so started by doing kind of just some uh, gene ontology and, and, and uh, keg pathway analysis, things that kind of look at um, you know what are the predicted functions of our of our regulated genes. Um, you know, and so interesting. You know, we we see things that we kind of expect to see. We're seeing changes in genes that that are are related to dopaminergic synapses to um, synaptic potentiation or depression, which these two pathways have a lot of overlap. Um, interestingly, some some things that are related to the immune system. Um, and, you know, the, the most robust effect that we saw was, was changes in, in, in genes that are related to DNA binding and things like, like control of transcription, um, you know, which I th think is really interesting and sort of suggesting that kind of, you know, at, at the root cause of this, you might be having uh, the microbiome affecting, um, you know, expression of genes that are, that, are, that are important for the control of expression of other genes, which may lead to kind of this um, forward cycle where you, where you see the magnitude of effects that we're seeing. Um, you know, so when we look at kind of the, when we take the proteins out of this DNA binding pathway and look at their predicted protein-protein interactions, if we were to assume that all the proteins were expressed, you, know, you can see that, that you're getting regulation of this kind of highly interactive network of proteins and that all these uh, proteins are, that are changed in our animals that lack a microbiome and get cocaine are predicted to be those that interact with each other and to, to have some kind of DNA binding effects uh, in ways that might control epigenetic regulation or, or transcriptional control. Um, you know, fr from there, we've kind of gone and done some, some analysis to try and figure out, you know, of the genes that are changed, what are, what are the genes that are thought to be upstream of those that might be controlling transcriptional regulation? So, you know, what are transcription factors or, or um, epigenetic writers or erasers, things that might be driving these downstream changes? Um, you know, and really, it seems like, you know, we, we get a bunch of hits out of this, but the one that's sort of most robustly regulated is this uh, CREB1 transcription factor. And so uh, CREB is a, a transcription factor that's been pretty widely studied um, in addiction and it's uh, an activity dependent um, transcription factor that's downstream of, of uh, dopaminergic activation and uh, cyclic AMP signaling. So it kind of makes sense as a, as a potential regulator of our expression. Um, you know, and so, and so but here we're seeing a lot of, a lot of genes that are downstream from, from this CREB protein in particular are are significantly regulated, and, and many, many of which are transcription factors themselves. And so CREB is a transcription factor that affects the expression of many other downstream factors and you know, really can, can be leading to some of these widespread changes that we're seeing uh, in transcriptional regulation. Um, yep, that's a summary of what I just said. Um, you know, and so this is a really interesting idea. And so the, within the field of substance use, there's this idea that um, you know, changes in transcriptional control and um, epigenetic regulation of DNA structure may be important for some of the long-term changes we're seeing in our patients and why they might be uh, prone to abstinence or uh, to relapse even after long-term abstinence. Um, you know, and so 
we're going to look at this this Krebs transcription factor here, which is something that um, you know is is activated by phosphorylation leads to downstream gene transcription. Um, you know, and, and there's been a whole bunch of literature from a bunch of different labs, um, a lot of which from Eric Nessler's lab, but others as well, basically showing this idea that that decreases in Krebs activity in the accumbens can lead to increased cocaine seeking reward, and we're we're seeing decreases in expression of a lot of these genes that are predicted to be downstream of Krebs, which is suggestive of, of, of decreases in activity of the protein. Um, you know, we wanted to look into that a little bit further. Um, so like I have here, Krebs, Krebs needs a phosphorylation site to be active, otherwise it's, it's inactive if it's not phosphorylated. And so when we look at this activated form of Krebs in our, in our same model where the animal's got the challenge injection of cocaine after withdrawal, um, we can see that the uh, <clears throat> animals with a normal microbiome show, you know, normal levels of crab activation, maybe with some some increases after cocaine, but the levels of phosphorylated crab in, in the animals lacking microbiome are markedly decreased. Um, you know, which you know, as as I mentioned previously, is is associated with in a bunch of other studies with increased drug seeking behaviors. And so, this is kind of in line with like this. This is potentially something that's being altered by the presence of a microbiome, and maybe. Uh, driving some of these gene uh, transcriptional changes. Um, the other thing that's important about the, the Krebs transcription factor is it's part of this, this large complex of proteins, which includes uh, the Krebs binding protein, which is a, also a histone acetyl transferase, which can um, lead to the transfer of acet acetyl marks to histone proteins, which can affect um, chromatin structure long term, lead to epigenetic regulation of gene expression downstream. Um, you know, so to kind of tie in with that, we've also done some analysis of um, these post-translational modifications of, of histones, which might be associated with, with dysregulation of CREB binding protein binding to its uh, partner in the nucleus. Um, and we see similar things when we look at this. Um, so um, this here is, is looking at uh, histone 3, lysine 27 acetyl. And so this is um, a histone mark that's associated with uh, relaxation of the DNA from, from around the histones and increased transcription of those genes. Um, and we're seeing decreases in, 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 this, in this histone acetylation mark. Um, similarly with a different, so this histone 3 lysine 9 acetyl, um, a different mark that's also associated with um, uh, you know, permissive DNA binding, uh, we, see, we see decreases in that acetyl mark. So <clears throat> I think that kind of gets us to this, the point where the, the idea is that we're, we're getting some factor from the gut microbiome that's important for the driving these drug-seeking behaviors, and it seems to be leading to uh, dysregulation of these important transcriptional pathways, uh, including the phosphorylated CREB and the, and the uh, histone acetyl transferase pathways. And so, you know, now we have this and we have these really interesting effects, and the question for us is, can we can we get more specific with this? Can we find something that that has um, potential for clinical translation as either a biomarker or some kind of therapeutic intervention? Um, you know, how, how do we go from our broad strokes model to, to something more specific? Um, and for this, like I mentioned mentioned earlier, one of the one of the main signaling pathways from the gut to the brain, um, you know, is, is via the production of the, of these. Um, neuroactive metabolites. And there's, there's this one group in particular that are known as the, the, you'll see the abbreviation SCFA for the rest of the talk, which is they're short chain fatty acids. Um, these are molecules that are produced by the breakdown of uh, soluble fiber in the gut by bacteria, and they're absorbed through the gut and can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. And there's actually been a good amount of work looking at these in other conditions. Um, you know, like I mentioned, they, they cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, you know, importantly, they've actually been shown in a bunch of studies to be uh, regulators of histone deacetylases, so things that are affecting uh, the drivers of, of those histone acetyl marks that I was talking about on the last slide. They can actually affect the machinery that drives those directly. Um, there's also a good literature showing that these that these molecules can regulate the activity of multiple different transcription factors, including CREB, like I talked about in the last slide. So um, we sort of started out with these as kind of our, you know, based, based on the literature and the abundance of them and their known effects on the brain, these are kind of our, our first major target for looking at metabolites that might be, might be relevant to the addiction-like behaviors. Um, and so importantly, we see there, there are three main short-chain fatty acids, acetic acid, uh, butyric acid, butyrate, and um, propionate. Um, and levels of all of them are pretty robustly decreased by our antibiotic treatment. So, you know, not, not only 
our antibiotics are reducing the, the bacteria, but they're also reducing their downstream uh, byproducts, which is not surprising, but it is important. Um, and so, you know, we, we've now worked on trying to see, okay, if we if we do a repletion of the of these metabolites, even in the absence of a microbiome, can we can we rescue those effects of, of the microbiome? Well, are are these metabolites driving the signaling from the gut to the brain that, that affects brain and behavior in these important ways? Um, and so these studies, these are actually done in rats. I still have a mouse drawing here, but this was this was done in rats. But um, <clears throat> it's a, it's the similar idea um, where we have groups that get either uh, the short chain fatty acid uh, cocktail just as a control, or animals that have antibiotics, they still lack a microbiome, but we're putting back the short chain fatty acids in their in their drinking water. So we can see, um, you know, animals that have no microbiome but have these these microbiome byproducts. How how does that affect their drug seeking type behaviors? Um, and so, like before, um, we do this acquisition of self-administration where the animals learn to, to self-administer cocaine. Um, and like before, there's no effect on that early acquisition behavior. And so that kind of lets us look at the drug-seeking behavior starting from, from, from kind of a cleaner footing. Um, and so what we see here, this is kind of the same thing. This is, um, here we're just doing the Q-induced seeking. We actually haven't gotten to do the cocaine-induced seeking here. Um, but our animals that have a normal microbiome but got the short chain fatty acids, there's no effect. They have normal discrimination of the active and the inactive levers. Um, but the thing that's really interesting is that these animals that, that lack a microbiome, where we put back these microbiome uh, metabolic byproducts, they also go back to normal. And they have these, these kind of um, restored levels of drug seeking. And um, just to kind of compare, compare across two experiments to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, um, you know, these are kind of overall control animals that get just plain drinking water. Uh, when we take away the microbiome with antibiotics, you get this, this market increase in this drug-seeking behavior. Um, after withdrawal is kind of uh, is, um, you know, thought to be uh, analogous of, of a relapse type behavior. Um, but then in purple here, importantly, these animals where they still don't have microbiome, but we've just put back these couple of metabolites, the, the behavior really goes right back to normal. So um, this is really, I think, really exciting and suggests some kind of mechanistic uh, pathway by which um, the, the gut can be signaling to the brain. Um, you know, and we've done some work trying to see, you know, is it affecting the, the transcriptional changes as well, since we thought that was the potential mechanism. Um, so we, we look at some uh, PCR uh, gene expression in, in, the, in the nucleus accumbens, again, the same brain region. Um, you know, we see the things that were decreased uh, in, the, in the antibiotic treated animals. When we have the antibiotic plus short chain fatty acid animals, it kind of goes back to baseline, um, suggesting normalization of, of important targets that are um, some of these downstream of Krebs targets that I was talking about earlier. Um, and we also have some newer data that um, is actually pretty pretty hot off the press. We haven't gotten to it too much. But we've actually been, been able to do full RNA sequencing on these animals and compare it to animals that um, get the antibiotics and compare it to just the short chain or and compare it to the short chain fatty acid and antibiotics. Um, you know, and we see things that we're seeing reversal in, in pathways related to Krebs signaling neurons, synaptogenesis, uh, and PKA, PKA signaling, which is upstream of Krebs. Kreb. So it's sort of suggesting that um, you know, repletion of these metabolites is, is affecting the behavior and kind of normalizing some of these transcriptional uh, control mechanisms that, that we saw to be dysregulated in animals lacking a microbiome. Um, we've also been looking at the, the Kreb activation using the phosphorylated Kreb assay. And we see the same thing here where uh, animals lacking a microbiome after a cocaine challenge have a decreased activation of Kreb and increased drug seeking. Um, and we actually see kind of increased activity of Krebs in animals that lack a microbiome but got, their, but got these metabolites um, put back. Um, similarly here, this is early days, but we see that there are also, if we put back even just one of these metabolites, which is acetic acid, um, and look at total um, levels of acetylated histone 3, uh, we see that um, it can lead to increases in, um, in histone acetylation. So um, that kind of leads me to our, to our, our working model here of what we're, what we're trying to work through. Um, you know, and so we have th this idea here that um, we have a normal microbiome where it has this complex array of uh, bacteria that are producing you know, myriad metabolites, including these short chain fatty acids, uh, which can signal to the brain um, and lead to, to normal regulation of Krebs um, and normal uh, regulation of, of chromatin structure via histone acetylation and, and potentially other mechanisms. 
you know, and the idea is that, um, you know, in animals with this depleted microbiome, you've depleted the bacteria, you've depleted these, met these metabolites, um, you know, and it's, it's altering activation of these important transcription factors and other um, DNA regulatory factors leading to dysregulated gene expression, um, which then leads to aberrant behavioral and synaptic plasticity. And so this is kind of our, our current working model of how we, how we think the microbiome is affecting the brain in this, in this model of drug seeking. Um, and I want to make sure I leave at least five minutes for questions here, but I, I, I now just wanted to kind of do a quick pivot and talk about how we're, we're thinking about how these projects could be translated to the clinic and how it might be relevant to, to us as psychiatrists one day, um, for, the, for those of us who are psychiatrists. Um, but, you know, kind of, I, I think important to everyone here is, is thinking about how, how can we improve care for, for patients um, in psychiatry. Um, you know, so when, when we're thinking about this, you know, thinking about various focuses for, for translational research, you know, we want, we want to think of a, a pathway of how we can develop these things. And that's, that's some of what I've been talking about with this animal model here. And so we want to work on identifying targets, um, you know, using these big data approaches like RNA sequencing and metabolomics and microbiome sequencing to identify uh, druggable targets that we think are affecting behavior um, in our animal models. And we're now working on trying to identify uh, some of these subjects as well by getting, getting samples from patients and looking at correlation of behavior. Um, you know, we're then kind of working on, on doing verification steps of these, trying to think of, you know, do these things that we see in animal models, are they, are they validated clinically? Are we seeing the same changes between our, our rodent model and our human models? Um, you know, and, and going forward, we're working on trying to develop some, some kind of reverse translation experiments, trying to see if there are things that we see uh, in the human population that will have effects in the rodent population and kind of be able to go back and forth between the two. Um, you know, all this is working towards development of, of, you know, like I mentioned earlier, working towards the development of, you know, potential for interventional trials down the road or, or development of biomarkers in this area um, that could be useful for our patients. Um, you know, sort of my, my goal as a, as a physician scientist and is to, you know, take this really strong foundation that we're developing these animal models and, and work on you know, comparing it to human models and, and, and trying to see if we can, we can translate any of these findings from, from animals to humans, take the human data, kind of go back and forth between humans and animals, and really work on developing um, a, a robust um, idea of how these things are, are, are working bidirectionally. <clears throat> um, you know, so how, how are we going to do this? Um, I think that the, the two main things that, that allow us to go back and forth between uh, animals and humans is, is uh, first, metagenomics. And so this is basically a collection of, of, of uh, colon samples or fecal samples and analysis of, of the, the genetic populations of different bacteria that are in there. And so, you know, um, in our human subjects who have cocaine use disorder, opioid use disorder, how, how are we seeing changes um, at the population level? in their gut microbiome? Are they having changes and measures of diversity that are, that are driven by changes in their lifestyle and dietary habits? Um, you know, are there specific populations of bacteria that we're seeing that really kind of correlate with behavior? Um, you know, I think kind of trying to, to see how any of these things relate to behavior in our, in our patient populations is something that, that's, that's easily doable, and maybe not easily, but certainly doable. Um, you know, and it's, it's something that we can do longitudinally within patients and, and relate to symptoms and, um, you know, think about how, how uh, things like drug craving are, are, are related to changes in the microbiome. Um, you know, and then we can kind of take these things, and in addition to things we're doing in the lab now, we can work on taking some of these changes from humans and doing uh, notobiotic and germ-free mice for mechanistic studies. So we can take changes um, uh, that we see in the human population and put them into germ-free mice and see, you know, do mice that have a, a humanized microbiome from a, from a substance use patient, do they, do they have kind of these changes in drug-seeking behaviors? Um, that we see in the human population. Can, can we get more mechanistic with the data from the humans? Um, you know, and the other thing I think that's, that's really an interesting possibility, um, and it's something that we have some funding for now as well, um, is looking at metabolomics. So how, how are metabolites that are produced by the microbiome being absorbed into the circulation, um, and how might be, they be affecting behaviors? And so um, kind of similarly, like, you know, this is attractive to me as someone who wants to do kind of translational things because we can, we can take blood samples and sort of see how things are um, altered in our patients and kind of, again, do the same thing. Use, use correlation um, with, with craving, with drug intake symptoms. Um, and we can also look longitudinally and within patients, how are these metabolomic changes um, related to, to um, clinical presentation? 
you know, kind of the same thing, taking, taking these meta metabolome uh, analyses, um, you know, and working to identify targets that we can, that we can then test in our animal models and kind of, again, kind of skip back and forth between, between these human patient populations and some of our animal models, um, you know, and, and start to get better ideas of these targeted uh, metabolite supplementation restriction paradigms that can affect drug seeking behaviors. Um, you know, so this is something that we're, we're, we're thinking of doing, we're, we're kind of working on building up some of this clinical translational research now, um, you know, really, really just trying to get it off the ground. We've worked on establishing the animal models, but, you know, kind of thinking about over the next five years about how we can, how, how I think this might move towards um, clinical tr translation, right? And so we got to, we have, health system that this you know large and diverse uh, patient population with substance use disorders and healthy controls um, you know we can start early on um, you know try to identify targets in patient populations with those two techniques with microbiome sequencing and metabolomics um, you know and then over the course of the years we're hoping to 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 build up and do some of that validation I talked about take take some of the findings from our patients bring it back to the laboratory see are the same effects and are there things that are replicable within patients um, are they, uh, do they continue to be associated with disease severity? Are they consistent across drug, um, drugs of uh, abuse? You know, uh, how, how, how can we develop and validate that? And then ultimately, I think my, my goal for all these things, and it's, you know, f five years, I'm sure is ambitious, but it's, it's, it's something that, that I'd like to continue to think about. Um, you know, can we do an intervention with um, some kind of probiotic a bacteria to target a specific population? Um, can we use prebiotics, which are things that uh, can feed the development of, of specific populations and kind of maybe help enhance diversity? Um, you know, or, or can we target some of these metabolites or even some of the receptors? And can we, can we start to refine this even more to try and find things that are signaling from the gut to brain in, in clinical ways? Um, you know, kind of going along with this, I think we can work on developing potential biomarkers, looking at some of these things that, that may drive uh, you know, long-term uh, drug seeking behaviors in our patients can 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 we target them and and, and try and develop um, risk and profiles to determine who's at risk for 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 relapse, who needs different treatment interventions, those kinds of things. So, um, you know, this was uh, I, I've been very very fortunate to work with an amazing an amazing team of people here. Um, like I mentioned at the outset, most of this work was done um, by a uh, grad student lab. Catherine Mecklow is a senior graduate student. Some also. Uh, from Kelsey O'Cern, who's another graduate student in the lab, but really kind of ever on its, we, we have a, 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 a whole team of fantastic postdocs, like Hofford and Aya Osman. Um, Tanner Houston is a technician in the lab now that's been, that's been tremendously helpful in driving these things forward. And really just a, another kind of cohort of people that have, um, you know, cycled through the lab and helped us out in various ways. And you know, thank, thankful to, to all the funding that we've, we've been fortunate to receive to uh, dri drive this work forward. And then all of our, uh, collaborators at Mount Sinai and beyond. So with that, I think it's I have about five minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you. That was, uh, <clears throat> that was fantastic. Um, while people start typing in the chat box, maybe I can uh, ask a, uh, I have about 18 questions. I can't get my camera to work, but. Okay. So, you know, what do you know about the uh, short chain fatty acids and how they get into the brain? Have you looked? At, is, is there some way to tag them and see how they metabolize? When when you give an animal SFA short chain fatty acids, I know you did one experiment with acetate and you've done other experiments with specific ones, but are most of your experiments a mix or are they pure short chain fat? Are they pure? Yeah. So, um, so, so far in all of our addiction studies, uh, we, we've been doing, um, a mixture of the three most common ones. And basically we, we put them back in at concentrations that are, that are physiological in animals that have a normal microbiome. Um, yeah. And some of the actually some of our autism studies, uh, Aya has been working specifically with, with the acetic acid. We found, we found a bunch of effects with just that one, but, um, for the addiction studies, it's mostly been the cocktail. Um, there are transporters that, that help cross the blood-brain barrier into the brain. Um, there's actually some work from Shelly Berger's lab at Penn that has used heavy labeled acetate and shows that, shows that it gets from the gut to the brain. So, um, and actually it shows it gets incorporated, uh, the, the, the acetyl from that actually gets in, incorporated into histone acetylation marks. So um, we haven't done that as much yet, but that's, you know, on the, on the horizon. Maybe just, uh, I'll ask one more question. One just came in, but so, you know, when you take a look at, what, what you see changing in, the, in your transcriptome uh, in the animals without 
and just on the antibiotics or what drug. And you look at things like CMAP. Um, do you find anything interesting? Connectivity map to see what, what drugs, like repurposing drugs. And then has somebody taken some of these short chain fatty acids and CMAP and see what they do and what drugs would, would be for yeah. possible repositioning? You know, it's, it, it, it's a great question. It's something I, I've, I've kind of, I've plugged them into CMAP a few times and then we haven't yet followed up on them, but it's, 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 it's a really great thought. I think there are, there are things that, that target the, both the receptors in the brain and the, the, the transporters. So th there are things that there are drugs that, that will affect them. I don't, I don't remember, you know, how specific they are, or if they're kind of things that are more promiscuous, but it's, it, it's, it's a, a really interesting uh, possibility, but kind of have, haven't, haven't gotten to that point yet, unfortunately. But you have a lot of, with all your RNA-seq data, you could try CMAP in different ways, right? What, what, what goes down, you know, just in the drug, in the model, what goes up in the presence of the SF, the, the short chain fatty acids with or without pre-exposure with or without antibiotics and you can maybe you know most of the time CMAP doesn't solve anything but once in a while as you probably know somebody gets a drug that actually like goes forward pretty quickly yeah. right right no I mean it's, it, it's it's a great idea it's something we should definitely definitely look into so we have an anonymous attendee who's asking a naive question and there's no such thing as a naive question uh, right. Can you name the strains of gut bacteria that seem to be associated with reduced drug seeking and or reduced anxiety? You may not be able to do that live, but you can. Yeah, so this, I mean, this is a, a really good question. And it's something that like, you know, I, I think it's, it's kind of a variant of one of the most common questions I get, which is sort of, yeah, like, you know, what what's a good microbiome? What, what are the things that are helpful? And I think the answer is that I, I think in some ways we're, we're, a little, um, we're a little too early to, to really be answering that question. I think, you know, there, there are some good data out there in the anxiety literature, literature looking at various lactobacillus species and how they affect the brain. Um, you know, there, there's, we, we have some early data suggesting that actinomyces bacteria actually may be driving some of the increased drug seeking, I want to say. Um, so, and we've actually been doing this by seeing, you know, when, when, we, when we do our antibiotic cocktails, we actually see that we, we kill off most of the bacteria, um, but there are actually some populations that kind of bloom because they're, they're resistant to the antibiotics. Um, you know, so we're actually working on doing some specific things, trying to look and see like the bacteria that are remaining, are they potentially important, right? Is it, are, 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 we, are we throwing the baby out with the bath water by saying, oh, well, you know, all, all the bugs are gone. And so whatever's left doesn't matter, you know, are the ones that are there still, still important, so. so um, I have a follow-up question to this question. So yep. I, I assume some of the reason you get this question is people are thinking about, um, you know, biologics, for example, you know, th things that, the, that might change the microbiome, you know, when taken orally. Is there any evidence that those things really, really work in terms of changing the microbiome? I, 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 would, I would say the evidence is not good at this point in time. I think, uh, you know, particularly probiotics, I think, um, you know, there, there are some kind of like, not super well done clinical studies on anxiety and depression like phenotypes and like, you know, it's, it, the issue is a lot of them, like, they don't really engraft very well in the microbiome and don't really actually change the contents of what's there meaningfully. Yeah. Um, so I think kind of like there various other strategies need to be developed. So you have a question in the Q and A, um, do you, from Bioma, do you plan to do RNA-seq in, in brain regions other than the nucleus, nucleus accumbens? Uh, the, the one word answer is yes. Um, we, we have done some in the uh, frontal cortex as well already. Um, kind of interestingly, it seems like the frontal cortex seems to be more sensitive to having gene expression changes just in the absence of the microbiome, even without drugs. So um, you get kind of more baseline changes in gene expression in the frontal cortex. This is medial prefrontal. Um, and we see, we've seen some effects there as well. I don't, I don't remember the specifics and I think those are all with opioids so far. So. That's an interesting it's, it's tie to, to the broad universe of psychiatric disorders, right? Where, where prefrontal cortex is often like you know, changing in important ways. Right, right, definitely. You know, and, and, and frontal cortex is very important for these kind of uh, drug seeking and relapse type behaviors. So it's something that, that is a great interest. And in, uh, Becca Hoffer, a postdoc in the lab, has been, has been doing a bunch of work with that and looking at developmental changes in the frontal cortex and the microbiome. So uh, I think we take the last question. People are beginning to turn to their next meetings. But Ron Reader is asking on the chat: Are there microbiome differences between mice who are known to be more easily addicted versus others? 
It's yeah, it's, it's a really good question. We, we, we've done some analysis where, where we did baseline uh, microbiome sequencing and looked at uh, drug intake. There, there, was, there was nothing that really jumped out, I would say. It seems like there were some things that were kind of loosely correlated with, with amount of drug intake, but um, there's nothing much, quite as striking as we In a bunch of shoeboxes in the animal facility, what's, how much variance is there, in fact, in the microbiome? Um, a decent amount. Like if if you were to go to from from room to room, you'll you'll get pretty significant differences, and you know certainly at, at the species level between between different colony rooms. But, but when you do experiments, do, do you keep do you keep animals in separate rooms when you do your experiments, or most likely they're all housed in a single rack? And oh yeah, we're we're we're, we're very specific. They all they all live in the same rack in the same room. We try and get them from the same. Uh, breeding area at Jackson to make sure they're kind of having the same baseline microbiome as much as we can. So it's, it's oh, probably a bit of a challenge. Yeah. So we may not know if there's, if there's not a, the huge amounts of variance in your experiment, you may, you know, it could be a really interesting study that somebody do someday, right? Just having varying natural microbiomes and then see if there are different behaviors associated with them and then kind of, yeah. So that was a great question from Ron. Okay. Well, um, we're kind of uh, at the end of the hour, top of the hour. Drew, that was a fantastic talk. It really is amazing to go from um, mice poop to, uh, you know, soon, soon to be clinical trials and addiction. Uh, that's a pretty great trajectory. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you for doing this and, and doing it. I, I, people don't know, but you volunteered on fairly short notice. And I, I personally appreciate that enormously. I don't know Renee does too. Yeah, but, uh, happy about that. Thank I, you. I, hope, I hope people enjoyed it. Thank you. You got an applause on the chat there from. <laughs> so, thanks, Ron. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.